power is felt in every corner of the globe. Its military spending equals the rest of the world. But has Washington finally overreached? With its debt skyrocketing, its infrastructure crumbling, and its competitors vying for influence? The world is undergoing a profound and complicated transformation. The developing economies would surpass the developing economies. Is all the talk of American decline premature? Let's show the world once again why the United States of America remains the greatest nation on earth. Or is the sun finally setting on the American century? This is Empire. Hello and welcome to Empire. I am Marwan Bishara. The United States has the world's biggest economy, strongest military, and the most influential culture. It's the only power with a global project defended and supported by more aircraft carriers, Fortune 500 companies, and more successful mediatainment conglomerates than any other. But America's post-Cold War optimism following the collapse of the Soviet Union has given way to pessimism forecasting a declining power and more crucially, the end of an American era. The rise of new regional and global powers, coupled with Washington's recent war fiascos and financial crises, have worsened the outlook for America's future. Countless books have gone beyond recent developments to illustrate a persistent decline, with titles like Suicide of a Superpower, The Empire Has No Clothes, Taming American Power, Nemesis, The Last Days of the American Republic, Colossus, the rise and fall of the American empire, and selling out a superpower. But how serious are the doomsday scenarios? Is this decline temporary or reversible? And what does it mean to America and the rest of the world? Well, joining me to answer these questions and more are Tom Engelhardt, editor of the American Empire Project and the popular website, Tom Dispatch, the author of The United States of Fear, Susan Glaser, Editor-in-Chief of Foreign Policy Magazine, former editor at the Washington Post, and co-author of Kremlin Rising, Vladimir Putin's Russia and the End of Revolution. And Cynthia Inlow, Professor of Women's Studies and International Development at Clark University, the author of The Real State of America Atlas, Mapping the Myths and Truths of the United States, and Bananas, Beaches and Bases, Making Feminist Sense of International Politics. Last but not least, Stephen Wolf, Professor of International Affairs at Harvard University, the author of Taming American Power and co-author of the Israel Lobby. Our starting point is U.S. strategic overstretch. What exactly is the United States afraid of? This ship is part of what's called a carrier battle group. It consists of an aircraft carrier, cruisers, destroyers, scores of combat aircraft, and a multitude of long and short range missiles and other weapons. It's so large, the entire thing requires roughly 10,000 military personnel to operate. The United States boasts a dozen carrier battle groups of this size. No other nation on Earth has one. The question is why? We are absolutely keeping America safe. The world is so complex right now. There's so many threats and challenges to our national security. You can't meet them in Boston and Los Angeles. You have to go out to meet them to defend the country. But for many, this idea of going out to meet these challenges is precisely the problem. If you look at the period since 1990, over 20 years now, there really is a period of enormous and continuing American military activism in all parts of the world for all kinds of purposes. I find that troubling. If you're withdrawing back to the continental of the United States and saying, we're no longer going to be engaged in the world because it's too hard or it's too expensive, isolationism is a recipe for failure in the 21st century. And yet another recipe for failure is economic calamity. And that puts funding squarely in the spotlight. In the fiscal year 2012, the United States government has $1.34 trillion to play with. Currently, $553 billion has been allocated to the defense budget. But as Washington has learned the hard way, winning hearts and minds doesn't come cheap. In other words, is this money well spent? 
Heavens no. I mean, absolutely not. I'm all for strong defense. I'm all for having a uh, very capable, well-resourced uh, military that uh, keeps uh, America safe, that can prevent anything like 9-11. Uh, uh, but the way we've gone about trying to prevent the recurrence of 9-11 is, uh, is absurd. But what about challenges at home? The economic dimension cannot be ignored. The U.S. military is a major domestic employer. The entire defense industry turns over billions upon billions of dollars every year. And the link between the strength of the American economy and the strength of the American military cannot be ignored. And critics are quick to point out the perils of such a symbiotic relationship. There is, in a sense, a partnership. It probably goes too far to call it a conspiracy because it's wide open. Uh, but there's a partnership between members of Congress, the armed services, and large-scale defense contractors all of whom benefit in different ways by maintaining very high levels of military spending. And that's why, during times of economic peril, politicians often resemble cheerleaders. You're the ones ensuring this alliance remains effective in meeting the challenges of the 21st century, from countering North Korea's nuclear program to building up ties of trade and investment that, that generate jobs back home to promoting democracy and human rights. You do it all. You're the full package. And of course, there's the matter of prestige, the projection of strength. Any drastic changes to American hard power will create a vacuum, and it's impossible to predict in today's world how that will be filled, or by whom. We can't just retreat to Fortress America you know, and bring up the drawbridge and hope to defend our uh, international security interests by bringing all the troops home. And thus, the cycle is endlessly perpetuated. Wars need funding. Funding creates jobs. Jobs strengthen the economy. So perhaps the most important question of all is whether geopolitical instability is the excuse rather than the justification. This is the essence of realpolitics. It's not an empire in, in the old-fashioned sense, but I think that there was a clear desire, and is a clear desire, on the part of uh, senior U.S. officials to want to ensure that the regimes that are in place are relatively deferential to the United States, they will pursue policies that are consistent with our policies, basically to put us in a position where uh, we're going to be able to call the shots. And that's, that's a form of imperialism. Because with the global economy the way it is these days, imperialism is very good for business. Tom, Stephen, you've written a lot about this whole overstretch. I mean, overstretch could actually also be good for business. It's not only a burden. What do you think? Um, I think we've had an enormous stimulus package abroad. We've been spending money like crazy. We put about 1.2 trillion a year. Maybe that's conservative. Um, it's, I think it's proved to be a kind of squandering of resources. And I think if you look at the United States and you look at, I mean, you've got several things. You've got a kind of a deindustrialization. You had the financialization that led to 2007, 2008. And you had this third thing, which is our urge to kind of take the world, to create a Pax Americana. And I think, I think it, too, has been a factor that's squandered American treasure. But it's good for business. Pax Americana. I think that's a, a mistake. Whenever the defense budget comes under pressure, you hear the argument that this is necessary to keep the American economy rolling. Most economists will tell you, however, that Pentagon spending is actually not the best way to stimulate the American economy. But almost everyone would see that there are other ways to invest the same amount of money that would create a much bigger economic payoff here at home, building infrastructure, whether it's roads and bridges or internet networks, things that would actually enhance the productivity of the American economy. So the excessive expenditure has actually been a drag on the United States. And we see that now when we're trying to get a budget deal. Right? Everyone understands that in order to get the American federal budget back on a sort of stable course, we're going to have to raise some taxes, we're going to have to cut some entitlements, and we're going to have to cut some defense spending. None of these dramatically, but all of them enough to make it all work. And that hasn't happened for political reasons, but not because cutting defense would actually harm the American economy in a big way. But in the end of the day, the defense budget as it is, 600 and some billion dollars, 
it's less than 5% of the American GDP. It's not a huge percent of the American economy. It's, 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 it's something around 4%, just under 4% of GDP. So it's something that uh, whether you support it or not, uh, you actually, we can, we can afford it. And that's part of the reason why it's continued to grow, because the United States has been so extraordinarily rich and successful. We've been able to finance this astonishing expansion of the military and associated, you know, sort of complex budget. If you look at the numbers, I, people's jaws always drop when they hear this, but the truth is that U.S. Uh, national security spending right now represents awfully close to 50 percent of all of the world's military expenditures combined. And I think when people hear that, they are just astonished. The scale and scope of the militarization of America's footprint in the world is something that Americans here at home actually are astonishingly unaware of. That said, I, I have to say, I have to comment on your sort of report that you had. There's no bad guys in there. The only conversation, you know, that we've been framed to have is, is a conversation about American imperial overstretch, as if we were the Roman Empire sort of conquering territories. And, and I think... Uh, You're actually far more vast than the Roman Empire. <laughs> I mean, uh, how many a, bases are there around model, the world? 1,000? Right? It's approximately 1,000 if you don't count, for instance, the 400-odd that we built in Afghanistan or those 505 that we've just given up in Iraq, etc. So if this is not an imperial outreach, I don't know what is. One of the problems of this kind of militarization of security, that is, convincing Americans that, in fact, the only way that they can feel secure is to have a fortress and an outreach, you know, global fortress. And I think, actually, the, there's a new discussion in the United States now. And I think, actually, not far from this studio is one of the Occupy Wall Street camps. And I think that's a discussion about, well, so what do you mean by security? Right? Whose security? Um, how solid is that security? How resilient is that security? And I think one of the things a lot of us are, well, some of us have been long convinced of this, but others are really beginning to understand that that kind of American popular culture of militarized security is really very shallow, um, and it's not really secure. Let's take a look at states with American bases in them. I mean, certainly you're more likely to accept an American oil deal or American business deal of some sort if there's an American base in your country, no? I think it depends very much on a case-by-case -case basis. I mean, there are a number of countries around the world who are, I think are actually very uh, dependent upon American protection and, uh, and grateful for it. Debate, grateful meaning? Uh, grateful that they, they appreciate it. They, they do business they, with it. Well, not just because they do business. South Korea likes having American protection there because they have a bad relationship with North Korea. Right? Um, Japan likes having American protection because they are worried about security reasons. But the, I guess the point I'd make is this is often viewed as a false uh, choice between complete isolationism and the United States taking over the world. The United States is not going to disengage from the entire world. We're not going back to Fortress America. The question is, what are the places where the United States should use its power, and how should the United States use its power in a constructive way? The problem with the last 10 years or so is that we've increasingly used our power in some foolish ways that have been bad for the United States and not particularly good for so, the places so, we've been using So you it. don't mind very much if they use power to get business contracts. No, the I question is when they're, not, when they're useless. Well, but I think that's a pretty, I mean, to, 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 to say that the exercise of American power is about, um, you know, forcing people to make business deals at the barrel of a gun, I, I think that's a pretty Why forcing? Un Enticing. Right. I think that's a pretty un-nuanced uh, view of the world. I don't think that Americans are in Afghanistan uh, to make business deals. And the truth is, you know who's in Afghanistan to make business deals? It's the Chinese. I think, I think it would be hard to argue that when the Bush administration went out into the world, they weren't thinking about energy flows. They were thinking about breaking OPEC. They were thinking about doing a lot of things, and they were thinking about basing our, us a kind of a South Korean model, 30,000 troops maybe, in the heart of the oil lands of the planet forever. Now, the thing is, you sometimes you go out with guns to get your contracts, and it doesn't work out that way. I want to bring the scale down a, a bit here and not talk about China and Japan and the U.S., but actually talk about people who live around U.S. bases. There was such a, an effective anti-bases movement in the Philippines that the Philippine Senate, much against their earlier inclinations, voted to end the basing agreement with the United States. It causes a lot of disruption of social life. This certainly was the, the justification for uh, 
getting the American bases out of Saudi Arabia after the first Gulf War. It's quite clear that, that, that part of the reason why al-Qaeda turned its attention to attacking the United States directly was their perception that infidels had, were now on sacred Islamic territory. It was not the only thing they were upset by, but that was clearly one of them. So our strategy of leaving five to 10,000 troops in Saudi Arabia as part of dual containment in the 1990s was one of the things that helped lead to that. Now, among other things, that doesn't tell you the United States should come home entirely, but it does tell you that having large on the ground military presences in various parts of the world can have what Charles Chalmers Johnson used to call blowback effects on the United States itself, which is why we ought to be rather careful about where we deploy forces and try to minimize the American military footprint as much as we can. So you're in favor of deployment around the world, except you want it to be intelligent deployment. Absolutely. So you are for empire, except that you want it to be uh, downsized uh, and, and, and clever. Do you think that deployment and empire are synonyms? Deployment around the world in 1,000 bases? No, who, who, no, else, I, who else around the world does that? Are deployment and empire synonyms? I mean, do the Chinese have uh, bases around the world? Do the Russians today have such bases? Do the Indians, the Brazilians, the Turks? Well, certainly, the Soviet, the, certainly the Soviet Union had bases all over the world, not as many as it's we no did. But it, and we no called it the Soviet Empire. Yeah, one should remember that every base is negotiated. And I don't mean amongst equals. It's definitely not amongst equals. And one of the things that is so irritating to South Koreans, many of whom are nervous about the North, but are still appalled at the inequality and injustice of the basing agreement. And they're called so they're called SOFAs, uh, SOFAs status, status of Forces yeah. Agreement. And in, That's the Iraqis. I mean, they're yes, pretty... Uh, and they are, for the most part, they are classified, which means well, I got a call from people in an unidentified South Asian country asking me if I knew the small print in the SOFA agreement between their government and the United States because it was not available to local citizens. So that what you have is you have every base is negotiated to reinforce the message that, one, your citizens don't matter because they're not going to find out what we've just given away, and two, that you are not really secure in your own citizen rights um, because of this basing agreement. So these sofas are not just burrs under the saddle. They really destroy a sense of, of civic culture in every country they're in. I, I think you did make a very important point about the fact that these are negotiated with governments, that there are reasons that these occur. It's not, you know, an invasion force suddenly swoops down, lands on your territory and says, you know, here's my Kalashnikov, uh, you know, I'd like to have a base on your territory. Uh, sometimes I, there sometimes it happens like that, but, and, so, and it, but you're right. It, I, it's also worth noting that the uh, the United States was unable to negotiate the kind of status of forces agreement that it wanted to get in Iraq. And one of the reasons that the American ground force presence is now leaving completely. It's called is, defeat. It's, yeah. it's, well, and, and it, by the way, it reminds us of something else that's important. Some of these very one-sided agreements in the past were negotiated between the United States, what were essentially military dictatorships. As countries become more democratic, as they have to pay more attention to what their own populations feel, the balance of political power in negotiating those arrangements begins to change. And I think that's what we're seeing in Iraq. However imperfect the Iraqi government may be, they felt they could not negotiate a one-sided agreement. They actually wanted the United States out on either staying on Iraqi on terms or These out. bases are is untenable. This, is, there's a kind of a madness to the situation which we're discussing very rationally in a way, and that is this. I mean, in the Cold War, a genuine major enemy, a giant nuclear arsenal, the Soviet Union, a giant army, an imperial power, that was that moment. Now the Soviet Union disappears one day, and the resulting period, we end up with a national security state a, a Pentagon budget, a military intelligence bureaucracy, a national security state that's staggeringly bigger in a world in which, at most, there are a few thousand scattered terrorists who, who want to do something to us. We're, we're dealing with, a, in, unsuccessfully, with a couple of minority insurgencies in the greater Middle East. I mean, it, it's, it's extraordinary to imagine that somehow we ended up with this, we ended up with this gigantic Call it what you will, imperial um, behemoth. Behemoth. Who else in the world has has a world project? No one has a world project but the United States. 
And who is there to protect that wall project? Call it free trade, call it capitalism, call it neoliberalism, whatever name you would like to attach to it. But who's to defend it? But our it's biggest trading partners are Canada and Europe. And, you know, I mean, they're not the They're the not countries. enforced at the barrel of a gun. Most of our trading relationships are, you know, what, by what, the wire of a base. But well, didn't just it. the Americans tell the Chinese, pay attention, we are a Pacific power? Right. But that has, I think, almost nothing to do with American economic interests in the, in the short or, or medium term. I think that is a concern over rising Chinese power, possibilities that China will attempt to either push us out or establish uh, its own sphere of influence, uh, not immediately, but uh, down the road. But it's not because we are depending upon the U.S. Navy to get us markets in Vietnam or get us markets in Singapore. Okay. Or it, it's like opportunistic that. as well, right? I mean, there's a sense that, you know, in the regional competition for power uh, between China and India, China and Japan, that the U.S. has an opportunity uh, to forge closer relationships with some of those countries that are anxious in their own region about the rise of China. This is actually a problem, and that's probably should take us to our second half of the show. But before we go to a news break, we will take a look at America's soft power, and perhaps American prestigious universities are a good case in point. Let's watch. America's education system is broken. If children are a country's future, then the U.S. appears to be squandering it. It has one of the most unequal education systems in the developed world. And yet, some American universities and colleges continue to shine. America boasts 17 of the world's top 20 universities, and this is according to the Chinese rankings. It has seven of the top 10 most influential think tanks over all fields. And 70% of the world's Nobel Prize winners are employed by American universities. And they are not just ivory towers. With close links to industry, elite universities in the US are the essential cogs in the economic engine. Facebook was born in Harvard, and Stanford was the midwife to Cisco, Hewlett Packard, and Google. However, whilst it might be good at the top, many schools remain underfunded, and critics say that they churn out underskilled graduates. We know beyond a shadow of a doubt the countries that out-educate us today, they will out-compete us tomorrow. And to maintain its advantage, the U.S. attracts the best professors and students to its top schools. What's special about UCLA? It's a great university, a magic place for public education. <laughs> There are 700,000 foreign students studying the American way. This kind of environment is better for my, my development. And it's a symbiotic relationship. Overseas students not only bring in $20 billion worth of foreign reserves, but their ideas help fuel Uncle Sam's most competitive high-tech industries. 52% of Silicon Valley startups were founded by immigrants, and foreigners account for 25% of American patent applications but it's definitely a two-way street. Foreigners educated in America help to spread the gospel of U.S. capitalism when they return home. If we learn some knowledge here and we can bring it back to China, uh, in that way we will uh, make benefit to our countries. And America is determined to maintain the upper hand when it comes to soft power. It spends twice as much as Europeans and four times as much as China on research and development. So chances are, that the next Mark Zuckerberg or Bill Gates will still be American for a little while longer. Welcome back. The collapse of the Soviet Union has demonstrated that the viability and durability of a superpower lies in the strength of its economy, not its military. With its share of the world economy shrinking over the last half a century from half to a quarter of the total, many claim that America's skyrocketing debt, dwindling productivity, exhausted middle class, and decaying infrastructure do not bode well for a 21st century superpower. And yet, there is much the world's foremost startup nation can boast about. America is the engine of the global economy. It boasts a GDP of nearly $15 trillion, and it's home to the world's reserve currency. In America, there's a chant that you always hear, USA, USA, we're number one, we're number one. 
but many are starting to question that belief. When it doesn't quite pan out that way, when you have economic problems at home, when you're challenged internationally in a political crisis, you still want to believe we're number one. And they're certainly being challenged right now. This is the first really big financial crisis. And when it all goes into reverse, then you get a crash. Because this was a super boom, uh, the crash element is very, very, very bad. Certainly there was a shift in power relations because of the economic changes at the end of 2008. But the first thing to say is this isn't new. But just because you have a power shift doesn't mean you have all of a sudden American decline and a new superpower. The U.S. is still 10 times richer than China. It's still the leader in lots of things, but it has to get used to the fact that lots of uh, countries around the world could look to Beijing as well as to Washington. It has to get used to the fact that it won't be the only driver of global growth. But the American president is not quite ready to concede the point. Let's meet the moment. Let's get to work. And let's show the world once again why the United States of America remains the greatest nation on earth. The country still has huge assets, but you can't say that the domestic policy agenda looks positive. The really big question is, can the U.S. get its own house in order? Over the last four years, American household income has declined by almost 10 percent. One in 10 adults is unemployed, and one in six is living on food stamps. The recent Occupy protests are just the latest to question the American dream. We rattled their cage and now they're cracking down. So how do they push us? We're not going to break. We've been, but we won't break. We go to the Middle East be like, hey, we're going to spread democracy, and here we are, our government suppressing democracy. It's just like, how much hypocritical can that get? But while America Inc. may have lost its AAA rating, American brands still dominate the globe. Coca-Cola has a global revenue of $35 billion per annum, Microsoft $69 billion, and Apple a whopping $100 billion. Rumors of the collapse of the U.S. Uh, tech sector innovation is, let's say, overblown. I think that there's a lot of innovation still in Silicon Valley. There's a lot of innovation in America, full stop. You can't count out companies like Google, Microsoft, Facebook. You know, they just keep coming. But even this dominance is falling away. In 2007, the top five global corporations were American. Today, there are only two, and the world is catching up fast. I don't think that that means that innovation is over in the, in the United States. It just means that there is you know, growth happening in a different way and at a different magnitude in some of these other markets, particularly in Asia. But whether it's the decline of the West or the rise of the rest, the dollar is still seen as the safest bet, giving economists some reason for optimism. At the moment, the US dollar wins the ugliness parade. As long as the Americans do not completely mess up the domestic situation, I think the dollar survives as the global reserve currency because there simply isn't anything else. So it's a mixed balance sheet. Since the middle of the 20th century, no other country has come close to rivaling America's economy. And yet its decline, however long it takes, now seems almost inevitable. If you thought the U.S. economy was going to rebound quickly, like after every recession, you will be sorely disappointed. For all the problems that the United States has had, whether we talk about economically or politically, there's always a point from which it can start again, rebuild, grow. Other countries don't have that luxury. So yes, uh, America, for all the talk of decline, is not going to implode. Susan. We've heard this before, right? American decline, decline of American economic power. You were in, in Moscow after the collapse of the Union. Is, is America facing anything similar? Is America really collapsing economically? Well, you know, that's an interesting comparison. Uh, Russia, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, was facing an existential crisis uh, of the sort that, that we, is certainly not yet upon us. But it is certainly uh, a conversation that uh, Washington pundits are having, that, uh, you know, TV talk shows are having, that, you know, there's a whole bookshelf you could fill up, uh, you know, if you're, you're so inclined this holiday season, there's about 20 books you could buy about the decline of America, how quickly is it happening, has, act has China actually already uh, overtaken the U.S. economically, or what's the date when that's going to 
going to happen. Uh, this is a, a robust debate that's occurring. We, we have a feature decline watch on our site, and and in part it's to make fun a little bit of the media's obsession uh, and I with took it this, seriously. right? You know, uh, your, but uh, but in part it's also a serious conversation that we're having. And you know, I would say the sort of polite conventional wisdom uh, in the center here has really centered around the debate of is this a period of relative decline uh, that the United States is embarking in, in which we basically keep the same international order, but expand it to fill those of rising powers, uh, particularly democratic powers such as Brazil uh, and Turkey, which while we have occasionally friction with them, are after all very close American allies and do share a set of values. Or, or is this a kind of implosion? It's hard to see, you know, that there's a moment where we're going to fall off the cliff, like in one of those uh, cartoons. Is it soft landing or is it falling over the cliff? Well, it, the path, I mean, it wouldn't have to be uh, anything but a soft landing. I mean, I think decline seems obvious to me at some level, but, but I, I, think, I think the answer is that we're, we are still an immensely rich country. We have a lot of resources. There's no reason that we should go over a cliff. However, there's no reason, but the path looks eerily cliff-like. I mean, I mean, just politically in the United States, I see no reason to believe any any 2012 election results, no matter what they are favoring, what party could lead to anything but more of a country. You know, we used to talk about ourselves as a can-do country, as, as a kind of a can't-do country through 2016. I just don't see, I mean, Stephen was talking about uh, rebuilding infrastructure, which is, of course, an absolute necessity. So the Soviet Union went down partially because its infrastructure tattered while it was in a war in Afghanistan and pouring money into its military. Um, but there's no evidence that there's any way, say, between now and 2016, that the U.S. is going to put real money into its infrastructure no matter what happens. So I, I, I say hard landing. Before we do, uh, yes, we can, no, we can't, is it, is it an American problem? Or is just the world rising way beyond America's capabilities as well? Well, I think that, it, that first of all, this concern about American decline has been a perennial. Right? You see it in the 50s, you see it in the 60s, you see it in the 70s, in the 80s, Japan was going to take over, and that didn't transpire. The United States' relative position has declined from World War II when we had half the world's economy, but that was inevitable. We've had roughly a quarter for 20 or 30 years, so the but decline you know, is very... But tell you, Stephen, China is not Japan. No, 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 I understand that. But Ch China will face many problems of its own in the years to come as well. An aging population, uh, some significant internal adjustments, real problems with pollution and infrastructure of their own. So it's not going to be easy for China. And that gets to your main point, is I think if you want to be worried, it's not so so much about decline in the United States. It's rather that virtually every part of the world now is facing real challenges. Europe is in, I think, a real crisis condition with her. the future of the euro is very much in doubt and untangling that mess is going to be very difficult. There's virtually no prospect of rapid economic growth in Europe anytime soon. All right. The Middle East has been convulsed by the Arab Spring. Uh, that's going to, I think, continue to be an issue for many Middle Eastern countries for many years to come as well. China, as I just said, will face real problems of its own. Japan has been in an economic slump for 20 years now, really. So America is living the honeymoon then. Well, so there's good news and bad news. If all you care about is America's relative position, I suppose that's good news that other places are having problems. But if you care about American prosperity, if you care about the ability of Americans to trade and invest and do well themselves, then you do have to worry that we are in a period of history which may last a decade or more where many parts of the world are troubled and all of them um, essentially hold each other back. And the problem there is that the politics then, when you have Japan, Europe, the United States, maybe some other parts in a prolonged slump, the politics start to turn very ugly. And that, I think, is, is really worrisome over time. I think really this, this setting up the world as if it were a hockey match, um, complete with the enforcers, um, is really not a very useful way to try and think about it. That is thinking about America decline. I mean, one of the things that has really fed American popular culture is this kind of anxiety about not being number one. Whereas if you talk to the Dutch, they're not worried about not being number one. I mean, maybe they were after the 1600s. But Let they alone being liked or not by the yeah, rest of the right. world. But it really has corrupted American public culture. It means that we we can't talk about things reasonably. And one of the things that's happening, and we're about to have a major discussion about what do you think of public life? What do you think of public investment? And that means 
government as well. But that has to happen across the whole country um, in it's, order to not only just build bridges, but to reestablish a much more realistic sense of America in the world. Well, I think you've made a really important point about the status anxiety uh, of being number one. And it's interesting because it, so far the conversation is oh, Barack Obama, the triumphalist. We saw him speaking to the State of the Union address and saying, hey, we're still number one. But actually, his Republican uh, challengers are pretty much united only in one thing right now, which is to beat up on Barack Obama as uh, somehow being an apologist an apologist uh, for the United States, that they are very much having a discussion about whether uh, Obama and the Democratic Party uh, are sufficient believers in American greatness. Back in 2009, Barack Obama said, well, I believe in American exceptionalism, just like I'm sure the Brits believed in British exceptionalism and the Greeks believed that in Greek exceptionalism. Well. That didn't go down well, to say the least. But, you know, that I think it's a very important and revealing conversation for for your viewers around the world to understand that uh, belief in this notion of America's special destiny, the idea that there is something powering our unique history. And the United States has had, in fact, a very unusual history. We had a very, very fast rise uh, to that number one status. We have benefits of being on a continent surrounded by and protected by two oceans. We have uh, this economic engine and, and the benefits of, you know, the sort of post-World War II international order being shaped around American economic institutions. So we have a lot of assets uh, in a fast-changing world. Uh, but and, and part of the debate that really does need to happen is what are the best ways to measure or, or see American greatness? It seems to me... Small this, G, not the, big G. Yeah, this, this show began by showing American aircraft carriers steaming around. And that's a, a very easy way for Americans to say, well, we must be number one. Look at this large military footprint we have. But the point is there's an entirely different way to look at Americans' role in the world and American influence, and that would be the influence that we have by creating a society here in the United States that others want to emulate, not let, in every Stephen, way. Stephen, let's talk about the society. Okay. It used to be the society about hard work. It used to be the society of the community. Is it becoming more of a society of entitlement? Lower taxes, bigger for government, we want to have it all, consume it all, invest little in infrastructure and so on. There, Is this the problem here in America? There, that's, I think, a problem for a very small uh, fragment of Americans. Americans, actually, if you look compared to most industrialized countries, work longer hours, uh, work more weekends, take fewer vacations. We're still a society where people work extraordinarily hard. Whether we are making other decisions, for example, on who should pay taxes and what share of them to balance America's budgets, or whether or not we have too because much. Because the budget is going up yeah, and the taxes are going down, budget, which exactly, creates deficit, it, I mean, it, as everyone would know. Exactly right. And whether or not we've allowed uh, the wealthiest Americans to not just have too much money, but also have too much political influence through that money. That, that's a, a genuine debate. But it's not about Americans suddenly becoming lazy and just wanting to sit around the house and watch television. No, in fact, one of the big problems for so many Americans is they're working longer hours and having less economic security. Right. But the question of an opportunity society, because we haven't really touched on this at all, but what is the role of a political system as imperfect as the one we have is uh, versus anywhere else in the world? And, you, you know, the question of soft power, as it were, uh, largely resides, you know, historically has resided in the fact that people around the world this is where they want to come to, that extraordinary influx of immigrants, the fact that at least in previous generations, Americans have shown they can rise from nothing uh, to you extraordinary wealth You think this is still the case? Uh, I would actually argue... Uh, There's no question it's still the case. I would argue that the, the set of protests that we've seen in the last couple of years, I mean, 2007, 2008 hit the meltdown, there was a kind of a silence, and then there have been two waves of protests so far here as part of a kind of a global protest, really. The first was the Tea Party. It looked like a right wing, older, older, retired white people. And then the second one, which was, uh, which is, which is young and, uh, and, and somewhat more diverse. Um, but I think both of them visibly, uh, from their different points of view, are, 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 are protests, protesters in mourning over the loss of the world that I grew up in, uh, they're, they're, in, they're, they're, in, they're in more, they know, they have a deep feeling that the world that they thought they were gonna get, that they were promised, that I grew up in, that you grew up in, that you grew up in, it is not going to come back. And this is, a, I think, a, an increasingly powerful. So, so, so what is that? Is, is that just they a don't, don't they, they, they didn't think they were gonna get it as an entitlement. They not thought as an entitlement. They no, no, we're talking about, but Cynthia, is there at least, okay, so let's look at the culture of 
lack of fairness. It seems a lot of people in the United States feel they, nowadays they that big three. bankers can get away with billions and small people, unemployed and so on and so forth, can get away with it's not just the, top, the top three um, countries in terms of inequality of income in amongst the developed world, that's the OECD, right? The, uh, the, the top three are Mexico, Turkey, and the third is the United States. That so what does that tell you? That tells you that the a lot of the people who are now protesting really think there's some basic unfairness going on here, as well as lack of public investment. I, I think there are two phenomena here, and they can both be correct. There is a widespread sense in the country that a small segment of people have managed to essentially write the rules, uh, or some of the rules, in their own favor. And that's the protest against essentially the financial industry. And moreover, that this group of increasingly unregulated people caused enormous damage to American society and got away with it. I think that's basically correct. So there is this anger at a sense of unfairness. At the same time, it can also be the case that if the American economy is is working reasonably well, there are greater opportunities for everyone here. You think the 99 and, and would be happy if just the economy is doing no, better? Say, they, they would still dislike the unfairness, but it is still a very dynamic economy. And the thing that worries people is whether or not the government will manage to um, get the American economy moving again to the point that then all that dynamism can come out. Again. Which, which takes us back to your point, uh, Susan. Uh, this part of, this aspect of the American system is not exactly attractive to the outside world. When you can see people getting away the way people did get away with major economic crimes, if you will, the last two years, none of them is going to be prosecuted or anything. Nor in Ireland, well, nor in Iceland. Well, I mean, right, there's a global crisis of, of capitalism which has been unfolding over the last several years, and that's why you see literally protests and, you know, serious assaults to political leadership uh, across the globe in, in every continent and in, in every way, shape, and form. What's, what's interesting to me about this conversation is to what extent has the United States lost its allure as uh, a haven, a magnet for the kind of immigrants, the kind of people who have powered this extraordinarily diverse and uh, really many faceted, not just economic, but it's, a, it's part of the political system too. Uh, and, you know, do you, do you see a lot of people saying, well, gee, China is, you know, so successful in powering uh, and making this incredible accomplishment, right, over the last decade of lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. It's an incredible accomplishment. Uh, nobody sees it as a city on a hill. Nobody sees it as like, you know, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, and let's go to China, where they're making jobs for people. Um, you know, it is about the political system, as flawed as it is, too. And the question that I have is, as we come through this crisis, what, where, what is it going to look like on the other side to people? You know, I think there's one factor we really haven't brought up here. When you talk about American de decline, you probably should be talking about decline. But everybody can say there's nothing new under the sun, but in fact, we're at, we're at a historical moment where there is something new under the sun. The actual planet is mm. under pressure at this point. Global warming is no small thing. By the end of this century, if things don't change, we could have an 11 degree rise in the globe's temperature. Now so that's, you, so that's you almost don't want to globalize the American model because consumerism, the way it happens here, the way they burn energy, if the Chinese will do it. I don't think it's like the US is going down and you're gonna get a Chinese empire rising. I think you've got a planet in crisis and we, we're just barely beginning to feel it. The question is, is there an alternative to the American model? Is there an alternative to the American leadership? There's a, an alternative within the United States. I mean, that's why there's a debate in the United States now. Actually, there, and there have always been alternatives within the United States. But the question is, and this will be electoral politics, but also will be cultural politics, to really kind of give that um, more legs, if you will. To, and I think to think about the alternative American model, which would be a fairer model, which would be a model that had a culture of public life, um, that which would be a model that didn't shout USA number one, um, but rather, you know, looked at world problems and tried to take part in the solution of world problems. That's a really alternative model. Stephen, this is it. Do we need to downsize the empire in all its forms and aspirations in order to I, I save the republic? Out, I will go out on a limb. I don't know if we'll get as far as Cynthia uh, is hoping. Uh, 
perhaps. But I think that as a consequence of changes that are happening in the world, the rise of a number of other powers, as has been mentioned, as a result of the fiscal pressure the United States is under here at home, not a disaster, but very serious, needs to be responded to. As a result of all of these things, you're going to see a downsizing of the United States. We're going to be out of Iraq. We're going to be out of Afghanistan. We're not going to do projects like that again anytime soon. We're already downsized in Europe. We are shifting attention to Asia, so that's going to stay there. But I would argue that 20 years from now, there'll be a much more modest American presence. It will not disappear, but it will be more modest. And I believe, and this is where I'm crossing my fingers, I believe there will be a greater effort to try and rebuild the United States, you know, nation building at home, as many people said. Not in Iraq. Right. Or and the only asterisk I'll put on that is if Tom is right about climate change and its potential global effects, this discussion may seem like a very minor issue 20 or 30 or 40 years from now, even for the United States. Tom, I'll give you the last word. You think, you think uh, know America, America's adventure or America's uh, interventionist instinct could be put in check? I think it is in check. I mean, I, that is, I, I, think, I think it's the nature of our world right now that, you know, I mean, Afghanistan, they're still talking about, you know, bases after 2014, 25,000 troops to 2020, whatever it might be. I think it's going to turn out to be something of a fantasy. I, I mean, we're, we won't sustain this, whatever we say. I mean, I, I agree. Based with in Australia, the Russians are complaining you're intervening in their affairs. Iran has just... Uh, exposed some kind of a drone yeah, over new, phone the over there. Drone, yeah. You just created Africa come? Yes, yes. No, all of this is happening. There's still there's still the urge to surge somewhere in there, but for some people. But I, I, I think realistically speaking, we're just going to come up against limits. And we'll be healthier for it. Yeah, three cheers. Well, that's one a positive note that one, I wanted to one end and on. One and a half cheers. Gentlemen, Susan, Cynthia, thank you for joining Empire. Thank, thank you. Sorry. Thank you very and much. I will be back for the last thoughts. America's national emblem and the symbol of its strength, the bald eagle, might be fierce and majestic, but it's the funny Mickey Mouse that rules with his red shorts, yellow shoes, and white gloves. The Pentagon wastes hundreds of billions on expensive weapons and distant military bases every year, but all too frequently fails to win wars or achieve US strategic objectives. On the other hand, Walt Disney, like it or not, generates tens of billions of dollars annually and in the process, has captured the attention and imagination of countless young people around the world through a distinctly American cultural narrative. In reality, America continues to gain more influence through the attraction of its soft power than through the destruction of its hard power. Many people have been killed because of the latter, but I have yet to hear about anyone dying under Mickey's watch. And that's the way it goes. Write to me with your suggestions to empire at aljazeera.net. Until next time.